basically with pole zero canceling, we are going to insert a zero in the loop, the same as what we wanted with a phantom zero, but it is not a phantom zero. It is a zero in the loop and therefore the zero will also appear in the transfer function because any zero in the loop gain will be zero of the servo function. And only if this zero coincides with a pole in the asymptotic gain, then we don't see it and we call it the phantom zero. But now we don't do anything with the asymptotic gain. We are only working in the loop and inserting a zero there. But think about this. How can I insert a zero in a loop? It means that beyond the frequency of the zero, the loop gain must increase. How is that possible? That's only possible if I throw something away. If I have an optimum design of the loop, I didn't throw any uh, gain away in the loop, then it is not possible to, uh, to, 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 to reduce that attenuation beyond some frequency. The only attenuation that is in the loop comes from the connection of the source to the amplifier, the load of the amplifier, and the feedback network. That are the three passive things in the loop. The rest should solely be transistors. So the source, the load, and the feedback network, there we found places to reduce attenuation, to create zeros in the loop gain, but also create poles in the asymptotic gain because the transfer from the source to the input of the amplifier, from the output of the amplifier to the load and the transfer of the feedback network are all in the asymptotic gain. So basically, I, if I designed the right controller, there is no way of finding a zero in the loop because you cannot break open transistors and there reduce any uh, attenuation. There's no way except for phantom zeros. So if you cannot find a way for a phantom zero, then you cannot find a way for a zero if you designed it correctly. So what I can do is I can introduce extra attenuation in the loop and then remove that attenuation beyond some frequency. And that is exactly what this technique is. You see here, an implementation of pole zero canceling. At the frequency where the impedance of CC equals minus RC, I created a short and no current from the controlled current source is able to charge CGS of the MOSFET because there's effectively a short. So this complex frequency S equals minus one over RC is the frequency of zero. But by placing CC there for very low frequencies, I'm effectively placing a capacitor in parallel with CISS, which means that the low frequency gain is reduced, although it's still infinite for the DC, but it is still reduced. So basically I'm first throwing a away loop gain and then stopping this effect beyond the zero. That's what I'm doing. So on this ground, you can already conclude that this technique is inferior to phantom zeros because phantom zeros, they use an existing attenuation in the loop and they remove it beyond this frequency, which gives me more loop gain. So talking about, for example, distortion, a phantom zero would always be preferred. Talking about energy storage, probably a phantom zero would always be uh, also be preferred. But now without talking about the preference for any technique, I would just like to introduce how we are going to do this. So if the zero, if I don't want to have this zero that I'm creating visible in the transfer, it must coincide with a pole that is somewhere else in the loop. And the only pole I have already in the loop is the parallel connection of CF in series with CS plus CISS1 and two times RC. So that is a frequency of a pole and at that frequency I place this zero. 
then I'm reducing the low frequency, but now, where is now the second pole? Well, the second pole is if this CC becomes short at very high frequencies, the only thing is left is RC in parallel with CISS2. And that will be the new pole. The new pole that you see, and it will be at a higher frequency because it will be above the zero. And the zero was on the old pole. So that is effectively pole splitting by means of pole zero cancelling. And now that we know the mechanism, it is easy to calculate the thing. So we bring the dominant pole closer to the origin, or we reduce the gain of the, at the dominant pole. That's what we are basically doing. We insert a zero on the second pole, the non-dominant, well, still belongs to the dominant group, but in terms of which is more dominant than the other, I call it the second, the second pole. And so we have the frequency of the of the, the zero. We know where it should be, and we can calculate the uh, values that are needed for compensation. So here we have the design equation for CC, basically. A new in pole is introduced now at this uh, new frequency about RC in parallel with CISS2. And this pole will be, because the other pole is in the origin, this pole will be at the square root of two times the bandwidth. Now, let's go to the implementation. You see here is a clear procedure, so we can automate again the design and see what happens. So let's go to slide, slide up again and go to the file P pole zero cancel which is the next one in my list. You see, we have three to go. So running it. Now let's start here. We have a uh, extra capacitance of 0.83 PF. The capacitance that was already there was more than one PF. So I would say this is not really dominating. So probably the new pole, uh, that it is not a very effective compensation. And the resistor we have is 165 ohm. Just calculate it from uh, the equations that I have. Um, no, we said cancel, sorry that I have here, everything is still the same, only the equations are different and they are according to what I said in the sheet. And I want to have the value of the CISS of the second transistor in it. So that's I just get by asking it from the circuit. But you see, it is definitely working because it was peaking up to zero to B and now it's from minus six to minus four. And this will probably be the same effect because we have either the effect of the, uh, the, the um, sorry, we have the effect of the zeros that are still there. And here you see what is happening, basically. So here we have the 45 degrees thing, and you see it is possible to get them almost on the 45 degrees, but you cannot really, uh, and, the, and then we have to check where the third one is because the third one comes in very close, very soon. So, um, definitely more effective maybe even then uh, it's not yet the, the not the good thing but you can make a third order butterworth maybe when then they are at uh, uh, the, uh, half the frequency of the third pole um, but more effective than the better than the Miller effect but still uh, not as good as the phantom zero as the input at the input well, I can show, of course, the uh, effect of the uh, the um, PZ cancel output also here, and but it is the same plus, of course. So just a little bit larger that you can see it clearly. What am I changing here? Not the capacitance, only the resistance. I'm tuning the zero and the 
pole uh, that is introduced or shifted, I leave the same. Of course, you can also make a step program in SlackCap to step two variables at one time and make a, uh, a plot and see if you can optimize it in a better way. But optimization is not really of interest. Here, we want to demonstrate the effect and see how you are going to design such things. And for the rest, you can put an optimizer on it to get a better response. But in here, we are just selecting between techniques and we still have the phantom zero with the resistor at the input as the most promising technique at the moment.